Somebody asked me during the session what I mean by the glory of God. That is a very good question because I've used it, what, a hundred times and haven't defined it and I'm really into clarity as far as it's possible and into definition. I think most arguments are settled by definitions. So let me try. Um, and I don't have it in my notes here. I'll just tell you what I think. Um, one of the reasons it's hard to define the glory of God is because there are realities that can't uh, be communicated through other mediums than themselves very effectively. Jonathan Edwards, who was, worked harder than anybody I know to put undescribable reality into words, has a section in his essay on the Trinity where he, you can just see him throwing up his hands and saying, words, 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 how inadequate these instruments are. And so, um, here's my replacement of one word with another set of ambiguous words called a definition. The glory of God is the beauty of his manifold perfections. Now the word beauty needs defining and how in the world are we going to do that? Who can define the word beauty? What you do when you have a word like beauty is point. You, I mean, if, if you try to come up with words like symmetry and harmony and balance and texture and I mean, you just, what is that, you know? <laughs> is that working? Am I getting a sense of what beauty is? You, you point to it. You say that sky or that baby or that woman or that canyon or this is beautiful. It has about it those traits which correspond to the fact that we're made to see and savor beautiful things. So it may not help, but it, it's at least an effort to say the glory of God is the beauty of his manifold perfections. And what I mean by manifold perfections is you could take any particular perfection, say like his power or his wisdom or his goodness, and you say, that's glorious. And, and that would mean it's, it's beautiful in, in all of its contours and in all of its relationships. But when I speak of the, the, the glory of God in total, I mean all of that he is coming together in its perfect interaction so that the totality is glory, is glorious, it's beautiful. Um, maybe this will help. Maybe not. What's the relationship between the holiness of God and the, the glory of God? Can you define the holiness of God? Now here's my effort at that. R.C. Sproul defines the holiness of God as his transcendent purity. That's the shortest definition he has. And he's trying to get at two things. Um, complete separation from all sin and defilement of any kind and complete otherness that's just exalted high and lifted up and different than us. Transcendent, and he puts the two together, transcendent purity is his holiness. My, I think that's right, and then I would go a little further and I would say, and because he's high, lifted up, and totally other, and because he's separate from all defiling and impurity, in him is light and there's no darkness at all. He is infinitely valuable. You know, the, the, the fundamental concept of, sep, of, of holiness is separateness uh, unto the Lord. So separateness. Now the Lord is separate unto the Lord. And when something is really, really, really valuable, you separate it, you put it in a big safe. Like the Mona Lisa. You don't just put the Mona Lisa on the street for everybody to walk by. You put it behind a huge bulletproof glass 
taste that everybody feels because it's separateness, that must be really valuable. Or there's this gigantic diamond somewhere in the world. It's probably worth a billion dollars. And you don't just pass, you just pass it around. When you get done with it, be sure I get it at the end. You know, you, you, you put it up here and you put a guard on either side. Use these holy angels, flaming fire, sword, and you put it behind a glass case. And you say that. If you see something that separate, you say, whew, that's really valuable. So in, in my mind, the holiness of God is his infinitely valuable self. His godness, his transcendence, his, his purity. Now the relationship between that and glory. Isaiah 6. And, and one, one cherubim cried to the other, you know, with, with six wings they flew, and with two they covered their face, and with two they covered their feet, because he's transcendently pure. And with two they flew, and each cried to the other, holy, holy, holy. The whole earth is filled with his... Why didn't they say holiness? You're right. I mean, holy, holy, holy. The whole earth is filled with their... Glory. What? Why'd you shift? My interpretation of that is the glory of God is his holiness gone public. Holiness is his intrinsic worth, his intrinsic value, his intrinsic godness, just his being that's unique and high and lifted up and, and separate and, and, and um valuable beyond all measure. The, he's the measure of all value, the measure of all truth, the measure of all things, the origin of all things, the upholder of all things, just infinitely out there separate. He's God and I'm not and my very existence hangs totally on him and he has chosen that there be a creation in which his, his um, beauty of holiness streams out and when it streams we call it glory. Glory is the is the public display of God's perfections. Okay, I know all that's inadequate, but that's my effort. I think about it a lot, but I can't, I can't, I can't get far. I think far better than to break your brain trying to articulate the ideal definition is to so immerse yourself in this book, you're just in it all the time. You're in glory. You're in holiness. You live in it. You know, very, very many times I read a text that I don't fully understand. You know, you know what I say to the Lord? Especially if it's a text that involves some kind of doing on my part. Or I say, Lord, I'm not sure what to do with this. But whatever it means, would you do that in me? So that maybe in the doing it, I discover what it is. <laughs> that's risky, but you have to trust him, you know, to do that. But I think that's exactly what a, a child does. You know, a father tells him to do something. He doesn't stand the word. <laughs> it's always, mm, I'm not sure what he wanted me to do, but I sure hope I wind up doing it because <laughs> I'm supposed to do it. Okay, here we are. That, that's the unit we just spent a whole lot of time on is what I meant by the supremacy of God in missions through worship. Missions is, exist because worship doesn't. That is, people falling short of the glory of God all over the world. They're not loving the glory of God. They're not exalting the glory of God. They're not making much of God. They're belittling God by ignoring Him or misunderstanding Him. And we want God vin vindicated in their lives and, and lifted up and praised. And we want them to you know, be glad, O oh nations, and praise the Lord. And so we... We want it, that's the fuel of missions, and we, we pursue it as the goal of missions. Now, secondly, we're three of these, prayer. We'll see if we can, we're probably not going to finish all of this in the hour and a, what do we have left? An hour and nine minutes, but we'll do our best. Prayer. We cannot know what prayer is for until we know that life is is war. That's my little slogan for understanding prayer in relation to missions. Life is war. That's not all it is, but it is always that. Our weakness in prayer may be owing largely to our neglect of this truth. So 
That's important. If you, if you feel like you might not have a, the strongest prayer life you'd like, and who doesn't, right? I've never met a person who's satisfied with his prayer life, ever. Um, one of the reasons is it may be that you're not understanding what life is, namely war, morning to night, and what prayer is in relation to that. So here's some texts on life is war. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. So Paul at the end of his life saying, it's been a fight. It's been a fight all the way. And I, I know we all have our favorite Im- metaphors for the Christian walk and Christian relationship. And some people don't like war imagery. They don't like fight imagery. And I'm sorry, you know, it's just there. And uh, it's not the only thing that's there. So relax, you know, you, you can have family images. He's my father. I'm his child. I sit in his lap lots. Okay, that's not war. So don't, don't hear me silencing any other biblical images. Just get this one. Because if you don't get this one, you may not know how to use the weapon of prayer. Fight the good fight, he says to Timothy. Luke 13, strive to enter through the narrow door. Hebrews 4.11, Strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort. Now, there's a lot of controversy around these things, especially in the blogosphere these days on the doctrine of sanctification. Like, oh, strive. That's not gospel talk. That's not gospel talk. Strive. Boo. We're done with striving. Jesus strove. He died. We rest. Well, read your Bible. It may be that the striving here is the striving to rest. (laughs) <laughs> that is to stop frantically trying to justify yourself by doing your job so that the boss will be pleased or frantically trying to be the perfect husband or frantically trying to, you know, got to get God pleased because he's not pleased. It may be that's what the striving is. But you don't, don't minimize the fact that Paul used the word strive. Agonizomai, agonize. This is no small battle to rest. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take your yoke upon me and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Somebody reads this verse and he says, why are you telling us to strive, for goodness sake? That's the opposite of strive. He just told me to come rest. So are you resting? No, you're not. So you need to strive. That is, get out your gun and blow the head off of your legalism. Cut your hand off of your lust. Gouge your eye out of your going after some idol. I mean, get serious about resting in Jesus. Life is war. If, if If you think you with the world, the flesh, and the devil ready to send you to hell, any minute of your life can lay down the arms that God has given you, the full armor of God, you're a sitting duck. Every athlete strives to use self-control in all things. They do it to obtain a perishable crown, we an imperishable. First Corinthians 9, 26, I don't run aimlessly. I don't box as one beating the air. I discipline my body and keep it under control lest after preaching to others I myself should be disqualified. (laughs) That's a a nice soft translation here. That's I pommel my body. (laughs) Didn't mean to do that. (laughs) I hope he doesn't bleed. I pommel my body. What is that? I think that's Jesus. Cut off your hand, gouge out your eye. That's what Jesus said. Better to cut off your hand, gouge out your eye, and then get serious about fighting sin. 2 Timothy 2.4, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits. 2 Timothy 10.3, though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war against the flesh. We, we are not waging war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive. These are images you can't rip out of your Bible. 
And not to know what life is means you won't know what prayer is. So here's what prayer is. Prayer is primarily a wartime walkie-talkie for the mission of the church as it advances against the powers of darkness and unbelief. It's not surprising that prayer malfunctions when we try to make it a domestic intercom to call upstairs for another pillow in the den. If you're not on a mission, that if, if you're not at war and you try to use, use uh, prayer, it's like, uh, hello, Jesus, uh, I need another pillow while I'm watching, watching this program down here. I go, oh, I'm a little discomfort. And bring a Coke while you're at it. It's not going to work. It wasn't made for that. What's made for is this. I'm, Jesus, I'm watching this TV, and I need to turn it off right now. I need to turn this off right now. I need help, please, because I'm going to be ruined tonight if I don't turn this off. I won't pray tonight. I won't love you tonight. I won't witness tonight. I'll have no power tonight. I'll be sucked into this thing I'm watching right now. Please, Jesus, show up. Shoot your gun. Do what you have to do to help me turn this off. That's prayer. That's what it's for. It's for not sinning. Look at this. Surviving in wartime. But watch yourselves lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the cares of this life and that day come upon you suddenly like a trap for it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth but take but stay awake at all times praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the son of man hmm So the function of prayer in that text is what? The Lord is about to come, and just before he comes, there are these threats. Really, they're there all through your life, and they are about to take you down so that you won't be able to stand before the Son of Man. You will have been swept away into unbelief and and drunkenness and and, uh, worldliness, and, and he says wakefulness, moral spiritual wakefulness. This is like, okay, your job out there on the edge as the sentry to protect your buddies back here from the enemies at night is to stay awake. Because if you go to sleep, they come in here and kill us all with bayonets. So stay awake. And that's, that's how serious. Stay awake praying. So get the, we need firepower in here. We, we, we need it 300 yards out. Don't rain on us. Because they're coming and we don't have any hope against that horde. So we need your firepower from back there on the, you know, these scenes of Iwo Jima and others where these boats are out there, these huge cannons and these guys on radio. So these, come on now. They're up there just going to get those bullets over, those, ca- those cannons over our head right there on the enemy. That's what prayer is, is for. That you may be able to escape all these things. Now, don't, don't jump to some kind of escapist eschatology that says we're going to be taken out of the world before he comes. That's, that's not what it says. It says that we may escape all these things that are going to take place and stand before the Son of Man when he comes. Escape means not be sucked into them, ruined by them. Prayer is central in surviving in wartime. I'm not, you might say, what's this got to do with missions? It's got everything to do with missions. You know, most of our missionaries are in places where they have access to the internet. Guess what you can do on the internet? Watch naked women. I mean, how many, how many missionaries are being ruined by the very same kinds of worldliness, men and women, that we are? They're subject to exactly the same temptations. They get tired. They get beat up. They don't, there's no place to go out to eat. There are no movies to watch. There's no you know, innocent downtime hardly. But they got internet. You think this kind of praying isn't crucial to their mission? Just surviving as Christians, being alive in Jesus and keeping themselves pure? Here's an interesting relationship between missions and prayer. Now, the imagery is not warfare here. I know that, but get the analogy. You did not choose me, Jesus said to his disciples. You didn't choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go, 
right? There's mission. You should go and bear fruit. And that fruit can be converts. It can be holiness in your own life. I, don't, I, don't, I think we need to break down that distinction. Just go and bear fruit that your fruit should abide. Now, what's the logic here? So that whatever you ask, the Father in my name, I'll give it to you. I'm giving you a mission so that whatever you ask, he'll give it to you. You see that? I chose you that you should go and bear fruit so that I chose you to go. I chose you to go. And the purpose, so that, the purpose for my choosing you to go is so that you'll get answers to prayer. (laughs) I think when I saw that, I thought, that's amazing. God is giving me a mission so that my prayers will be answered. Which means prayer's not for a domestic intercom. Like, hello, another pillow, please. It's for the mission. That's what it says. I'm, I'm giving you a mission so that you can have the pleasure, the fulfillment of getting, you know, the, the intercom works now. Oh, look, it works. It works on the field. It works when the bullets are flying. It works when I'm engaged with the enemy. It works. It wasn't working back home, and now it works. And one of the reasons I think we just have a pretty weak prayer life is because we're not on mission, and therefore we're not desperate. We're not desperate for him to show up when we talk to an unbeliever or show up when we try to do a good deed for somebody and we don't want to, you know, be sunk in our discouragement when they reject us. Amazing text. We are called to pray for workers and converts. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. That's got to be one of the most amazing texts on prayer because you've got to be kidding, Jesus, aren't you? You're kidding. You're telling the farmhands to go to the expert agriculturalist farm who's got his doctorate in in agriculture to tell him what he needs to do to get a good harvest (laughs) kidding i'm going to tell god i'm going to ask god to send more laborers like you know how many laborers are needed isn't that amazing what would you what do you make of that that jesus tells you to tell God who knows everything and is infinitely wise to send reinforcements to Afghanistan. You you know about Afghanistan? Uh, Can I inform you, God, about Afghanistan? No. No, you can't. This is not an information thing. So what is it? (laughs) Pascal put it like this. Prayer is God's granting to humans the dignity of causality. He, he didn't have to use prayer at this moment. He can do Afghanistan just fine with nobody asking him to. He can put it in your heart to go wherever he wants you to go and he'll get it done without me asking him to. He can do that. He just decides not to. I am going to not only be decisive in getting people where they need to be for my mission, I'm also going to stir in some secondary causes to let you have the dignity of causality in my way of doing it. Your prayer will make a difference in whether I send them. I ordain that it make a difference, that you can be a partner in this. That's, that's what that text implies. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. And so we not only pray for workers, we pray for converts. If you ever needed a a Bible verse just to encourage you to keep praying for your father, mother, sister, brother, friend, neighbor, cousin, child who's not walking with God, if you need a verse, there it is, Romans 10, 1. 
Paul prayed over and over for his kinsmen according to the flesh, and he grieved deeply that so many Jewish people weren't embracing his Messiah, their Messiah. So prayer for workers and prayer for converts, the dignity of causality. In prayer, God grants us the dignity of causality, but God's, God's causality is decisive. God is the one who saves sinners and opens their eyes. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice. There will be one flock. He is going to get it done. Those are sovereign musts and wills. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. No one can come to me. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. There were some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe, but who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you, no one can come unless it is granted him. So this drawing is now called a granting by the Father. So God decisively saves sinners, and prayer is his, one of his instruments. Here's another, I think I'll skip this one just to keep us moving. God brings about conversion decisively through the Word. I preached at a missions conference in 1988 in Denver, and um, they gave me the title, Prayer the work of missions. I remember like it was yesterday, that title, and I, I just kept, as I was preparing, sitting at my desk, looking, prayer, the work of missions, prayer, the work of missions. And I began my lecture by saying, prayer, the work of missions. It's not the work of missions. And it disconcerted my, I mean, they built the whole conference around prayer, the work of missions. And I say, it's just not the work of missions. Preaching is the work, of, the work of missions, and prayer is the power that wields the word. So I did wind up making very much of prayer, which they were happy with. But in those days, there was a prayer movement. Prayer movement in the Twin Cities. We, we, we gathered the whole cities for seven years together. Some of you may remember this. In the late 70s, we, we tried to fill the Metrodome. We got about 10,000 people uh, in the Metrodome. And we did this for seven years, pulling everybody together from all the denominations in a great prayer movement. Prayer was, was just in the air in those days. Pastors, remember, pastors gathering for prayer in all the cities around the, around the country because everybody was saying, unless you're unified in prayer, God can't bring revival. And, and I was in it. I was just right at the thick of that. I was, I, I was the one who helped design the affirmation of faith, which we use the Lausanne statement for everybody. And so I loved it. I, I thought it was the right thing to do. But I also realized that some people were taking it too far. They were elevating prayer above the word. And so here I'm trying to show that it's the word that saves sinners. Prayer empowers the word. It's not the other way around. Prayer, doesn't, prayer is not the immediate effective agent of salvation. The Word is. So let me show you that and how they relate. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Or 1 Peter 1.23, this is really important text. You have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding Word of God, for all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower fails, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So, um, through the living and abiding word, this word is the gospel. That's how people get saved. How were you born again? The, the instrument, the immediate instrument touching instrument on your dead heart was the Word of God, empowered by the Spirit of God. Of His own will, He brought us forth by the Word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruit. So, Word is central. Now, how does faith relate to that? I mean, uh, prayer relate to that. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. Ephesians 6, that you may be able to stand and withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having fastened on, 
having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on readiness given by the gospel of peace in all circumstances, taking the shield of faith by which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, comma, no break in the sentence, participle, praying. Take the sword praying. Take the sword praying. Take the sword praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that and keep alert. Same as Luke. Keep alert with all perseverance making supplication for all the saints and also for me that the words, words, words may be given me in the opening of my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. That's the way prayer relates to the, to the word. The, the word is, is the is the penetrating instrument by which the Holy Spirit saves sinners. And prayer is, is I got these several images in my mind, it's, the, it's this booster power behind the Word, just shoves it in, that is, uh, calls down the power of the Holy Spirit to shove it into the heart, or it's the, it's the hand on the sword. So the sword, Word of God, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God, and the hand that wields it with, with power is a praying hand. So when I preached prayer, the work of missions, I said, no, no, it's not the work of missions. The work of missions, get out there and risk your life to speak saving words and prayer from home and prayer in your own heart and prayer from your family and prayer from all around you is just powerfully doing what Paul pleaded that it would would do here, that words may be given me in the opening of my mouth. So when we gather down in the prayer room for 30 minutes before I preach and we worship, I love those minutes. It's funny, you know, I'll just throw in a little parenthesis here. I go to speak in a lot of places. It's amazing to me how many places I go where they don't pray. Or if they do, it's just a little last minute. Okay, can we pray for you before you go up? Well, yeah, please. <laughs> Like, I mean, I've got the devil, the world, everything is against me here. It would be helpful. And, and you know, in 30 seconds, God, I think something's wrong here. So we, we give at least 30 minutes to soak me down there before I come up here to, to preach. And, and I just, I mean, I'm sitting there thinking, upstairs, there's, this room is going to have five or 600 people in it. And... Uh, and I'm expected to save sinners, open the eyes of the blind, defeat the devil, shut the mouth of lions, heal the sick, reconcile the alienated, none of which I can do. I can't do any of it. So how's it going to happen? God, well, has God at all appointed that he might respond to prayer? Yes. So let's do it. Let's do it. Missions advances by the word and the word is empowered by prayer look at acts 4:29 now lord look upon their threats they're praying they're praying look upon their threats and grant grant your servants to continue to speak your word so this is prayer you grant that we be able to speak the word with all boldness while you stretch forth your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And what happens when you're filled with the Holy Spirit? You speak the word of God with boldness. That's how prayer works in the advance of the mission. Bringing in whatever miracles God is pleased to use by way of confirming evidences. Signs and wonders, fine. But we were talking last night, nothing replaces this word. Other things are there, they're subordinate, they're important, but they're they're not saving. Maybe this would be a good place to stick this sentence in. When I spoke in Lausanne at the big missions conference last October, a year ago now, um, I, I went there 
with one main goal, that that 4,000-person group would be encouraged to collectively say, we evangelicals from all the countries of the world, almost all the countries of the world, I think 204 countries of the world, we evangelicals say people are lost without Christ and without the gospel. Because that's not being said clearly in a lot of places today. And the, so I had a 28-minute message to give, and the most important sentence I felt I had was this. I said, can we all, and I'm looking at all these delegates, can we all agree to say this? Christians care about all suffering, especially eternal suffering. Can we get it like that? We care about AIDS. We care about human trafficking. We care about poverty. We care about injustices. And we especially care about eternal suffering. Can we just say that? And then they broke up into table groups of eight or so, and it was a very controversial sentence that was just a buzz for a long time because a lot of people didn't like it. They didn't like it. And there are reasons. A lot of people don't believe in eternal suffering. That's one reason. Even evangelicals. The very term is abhorrent. Eternal suffering? I mean, that H-E-L-L is what we're talking about. And they don't believe it. So that's... And others, they feel, oh, that's going to minimize justice issues. It's going to minimize, you know, relieving the, the uh, hurts of the, of the suffering. I said, why, why would it do that? There's just deep underlying unbelief in eternal lostness all over the world in Christians. Deep underlying doubt that people are lost because if they're lost and they will suffer forever, that causes all their suffering here to pale by comparison. Not to pale, okay? Suffering is suffering. You hurt, you hurt. But that's going to be extended forever. I mean, if you think human trafficking is bad because of this woman being taken at 11 years old and used like a slave for 10 years, you think that's bad? What if she's treated like that forever by men in hell? Would that matter to you? <laughs> if you don't think it matters to you, then you don't love her. You're just into a politically correct justice game. That's what you're doing. It's politically correct to be in favor of human trafficking. I mean, to, to fight human trafficking right now. It is the thing to do. And you're into it because it fits in your church. You don't love her. Of course, they get real mad if you say that. But they, they just don't believe. So... Um, I'm saying that here because this word, this word of God saves her. We should want to get her out of that. And I'm thankful that that's an issue today. I'm thankful that contemporary slavery understood as human trafficking is a burden on the church. I'm thankful for that. <sighs> But if those involved in it don't care about her eternal salvation more than they care about her release, they don't love her. You just have to reject hell if you don't believe that. Missions really, really, really matters. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead. Pray for us. Pastor Spurgeon was asked one time, how do you account for your success in the ministry of people coming to Christ? And he said, my people pray for me. Colossians 3, 4, 3. Pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word. Do you pray that for your missionaries every day? If you've got just a few, I mean, you can't pray for thousands. you get one or two or three or four or the the calendar that we have at Bethlehem once a day, one missionary a day. You pray that, God, open a door for them today. 
They want it more than anything. They're frustrated that they've gone so long and they've seen so little fruit. Would you have mercy upon them and on the people they meet? Would you open a door for them to just blow the hinges off? Do something unusual today, Lord, for them and grant them to be able to speak the word with, with boldness that they may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. Prayer shows the supremacy of God in missions because... God gets glory when he gets depended on in prayer. Call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. That's called Robinson Crusoe's text. Spurgeon has a sermon called Robinson Crusoe's text. As you read the novel Robinson Crusoe, this is the text that's in the book. Call upon me in the day of trouble. So I'm calling on you and I will deliver you and you will glorify me. Let's get this circle going here. I'm calling you. You're answering me, I'm glorifying you. Now, I think God has chosen to do missions through prayer so that he gets more glory. In other words, the end point of missions is worship, and all along the way, zeal for his glory is shaping the way it gets done, and one of the ways it gets done is prayer, and the other is suffering. That's the rest of this, the rest of this 30, 40 minutes we have together. The word and the mission will succeed. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He cannot fail. He's got all authority. This gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. Then the end will come. It's going to happen. The word cannot come back empty. Or Job 42, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. So God's going to get the mission done. So that's the end of my my prayer section, and I'm arguing that it is not the work of missions, because the Word is the work of missions, and prayer is the the hand uh, that grips the sword and wields it in the power of God, or it's the booster behind it that drives the sword of the Word into the heart. It's It's the power that opens doors in front of the Word, all these images that Paul uses, but this is what saves people by the power of the Holy Spirit. The gospel is what saves people. You were born again, not with perishable seed, but with imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. And that door was opened by by prayer. And secondly, I argued, since prayer calls upon God, admitting I'm weak, I'm foolish, I'm bankrupt, and you're rich, and you're smart, and you're strong, so come on and make it happen. When that, he just looks great. Prayer gets you on your face and gets God on his throne and makes him look like God. Whereas if you, if you just, I'm going to do the mission. I don't need to pray. I'm going to do it. You'll get the glory and God will be sunk in obscurity behind your justice issues. Which won't do anybody any good in the long run. Questions before we move this whole definition of prayer uh, which I agree with but how do you recalibrate how churches pray and I'll give you an example we pray for our leaders but sometimes we pray for a political result yeah question is, how do you recalibrate this understanding of prayer so that when you pray for your political leaders, you're not praying for a Democratic, Republican agenda so that your, say, your prayers just sound like, I'm adding to your words now, sound like political slogans? That's a very good question. Because listening to some groups pray for their, their leaders does sound a little bit too partisan, doesn't it? Um, I'm, I'm looking for a text here that's going to be a part of my answer. First of all then, this is First Timothy 2. First of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings, for all who are in high positions, like Supreme Court or governor or mayor, for kings, for all who are in high positions, that we 
may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Now, if you follow the train of argument there, it goes something like this. Pray for kings so that life in this country can be of such a nature that uh, salvation would come to more and more people. I'll read it again so if you can see that's an accurate paraphrase. Pray for kings that we may lead a peaceable and quiet life. Now, what that, I think that means is if there's anarchy in a country, if there's mob rule, evangelism becomes extremely difficult. If, if the streets are on fire and all the institutions are crumbling and coming down and the whole fabric is unraveling in a culture, the spread of the gospel and the, the worshiping of God's people and the doing is not impossible. I mean, God's still alive and well in those situations, but he's saying, I don't, I don't want that to happen. I don't want that to happen anywhere because, he says, that there be a peaceable and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God. Why? Because he desires all people to be saved. There's, there's a correlation between effective evangelism and stability and peace in culture. The, 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 here's the general point. Let the prayers for leaders be governed by kingdom purposes, gospel purposes, saving purposes, not primarily political purposes. Now, admittedly, political people are going to see an overlap there. <laughs> They're going to say, this policy is going to make for more stability or more uh, prosperity than this. And, and uh, I, I'm not going to, I mean, if you are totally, deeply, powerfully persuaded in your heart that a certain economic policy will do more good to more people, how can you not pray for it? For me, in this pulpit, I'm not going to pray that way. I'm not. Even if I believe it, I'm not. And I'll tell you why. I am jealous that the, that the pulpit, I'm talking symbolically here now, that the place of the preaching of the Word of God be protected even from right political partisanship. Because as soon as the Word of God begins to be co-opted by any particular uh, political side, even a good side, it starts to feel like that instead of a prophetic incisive words spoken out of heaven to humanity, Republican and Democrat, with nobody, you know, I'm, God is not a Republican. He's not a Democrat. He is God. And I want the word of God to land on all factions and all groups with an independence and a power that calls everybody into question and offers gospel to everybody. So I think that's the way I think generally we should pray. We, we should pray as, like if, if you, if we are, we are citizens of, of heaven and we await a savior Jesus who will transform our b lowly bodies to be like his glorious body first Peter th I mean Philippians 3 21 so I'm a citizen first of heaven I'm not a citizen of America. I'm not an American first I'm a I'm a Christian first and so I'm I'm praying Christian causes advance of the gospel King Jesus I'm going to pray if I pray for Obama help him to submit to the King Jesus live under the lordship of Jesus and leave open how that looks I can tell him how it looks like I mean I know some clear things from the Bible how it looks he's not going to uh, cheat on his wife he's not going to lie but mainly I'm going to say bring him under submission to Jesus bring the Supreme Court under the lordship of Jesus that kind of big kingdom praying okay we got lots to do, and you may have lots of questions. I'll, uh, I'll hang out here for a little while afterwards. I told my wife to pick me up for another birthday party at 12.30. So I'll be here from 12 to 12.30 if you want to talk some more afterwards, but we, we should keep moving. Sup uh, the supremacy of God in missions through suffering. This is the last unit, and uh, may, maybe the most important in our day. Um, we'll see what you think. The Great Commission won't be finished without suffering. Why? The highest reason is that God's purposes to be most glorified through the gladness of a redeemed people is accomplished best this way. Both the redeemed missionaries 
and the people, God wins through them. I'm going to argue for that. That there is something about suffering that gets more glory for God than if he chose to do it without his missionaries ever having to suffer. So let's see if that's biblical or not. The glory of God shines most brightly on earth in the gladness of his people through suffering. That's a huge statement. That's a risky statement. I mean, who am I? And you, you're suffering and I'm telling you this. And that, like, who? What? The glory of God shines most brightly on earth in the gladness of his people when they're suffering. It's easy to be glad when you're not suffering. It's easy to be angry when you're suffering. But to be glad when you're suffering is strange. Therefore, the greatness, uh, God himself is our supreme treasure. His steadfast love is better than life. And therefore, the greatness of his worth is seen most clearly when we are willing to suffer, even give up our lives to have a fuller knowledge and enjoyment of him. We measure the worth of a treasure by what we gladly give up in order to have it. I'm saying there's more of God to be known as you lay your life down for the unreached than there is at home probably, at least for those who are called in that direction. The light of the world and the joyful suffering of God's people. So let me take a few minutes on Matthew 5. I want to show you something here uh, that I had not seen before just a few years ago when I first saw this. I want to know what is the light of the world and what is the salt of the earth. Because as, as those who care about lost people around us here and for the nations, if, if he says that the people of God are the light of the world, that means people can see God, they can see the glory of God, how, what would that be? What would the light be? And salt, they're salt, so when, when the world tastes them, they want more. I really do believe it, it, it means tasty, not just preservative or, you know, fertilizer. Um, I think salt meant huh, that's good. Meat tastes better when you got salt on it. Like, mm, I'm gonna, more of this. So the people of God are, are salty in the sense that when you, when you bump into them, you say, well, I need to know more about this. I, I want to figure you out. So let's read this. Blessed are you when others um, revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil. So you got reviling and persecuting and slander. Um, against you. And these things are infuriating, right? Nobody likes this. You get lied about? Say, I didn't say that. Don't say I said it. I didn't say it. It makes you angry, you know. Or somebody mistreats you or reviles you. And so he says, rejoice. They'd be glad. And then, well, how can you do that? How can you possibly rejoice when it's just infuriating to be treated like that? The answer, your reward is great in heaven. I said to the staff the other day, I think my main, my main issue in life is to fall more in love with my future. And I had this text in mind. My, my main issue in life is just to, to, to do that because, because I'm an angry man lots of times instead of a glad man. I, I just, that's sin. It's just plain sin. My, my, the anger of man does not work the righteousness of God. 99 times out of 100, the anger of man is not working the righteousness of God. There is righteous anger. It's about 1% of the time. Most of our anger is sinful. Most of our anger hurts people. Most of our anger is pride and selfish and yeah, and the failure to love that reward and to be so blown away by the gracious goodness of God to promise you to own the world and be infinitely happy, full and lasting at his right hand. And you're so happy in him and that promise that right now the reviling coming your way can't shake your inner core of contentment. Boy, do I want to be there. 65 years old, still wanting to be there. You young guys, gals, get there sooner. <laughs> Just get there sooner. For 
So they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, here come these images. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its flavor, it can be restored. It's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out, trampled underfoot. And here comes the second one. You're the light of the world. So now we've got salt of the earth and light of the world. One, two. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand that it may give light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works. And we think, aha, there's the definition right there. They see your good deeds and give glory to your Father in heaven. And, and I think you're, we're almost right when we say that. I mean, we are right, but we're just not all, all there yet. Because... How do you do good works so that you don't get the glory? I mean, most people, if they see you do good works, say, you're a nice person. They don't say, God is great. Why don't they say God is great when we do a nice deed? Like stop and help somebody change his tire or help somebody shovel their driveway in the snow or whatever. People, I'm always, always, lots of times, seems frequent. A lot of people are drunk in my neighborhood. It's real sad. It's really, really, really sad. So, if, you know, if, you, if, you saw, if where you live, you saw a guy, half his legs in the street and half his legs on the, on the sidewalk, and he's just totally unconscious, what would you do? Well, probably the first thing you'd just call 911. Well, in my day, the first thing I do is go out and talk to him. I don't call 911 right away because I know I, 99% of the time, this guy doesn't want 911. He does not want me to call 911. He wants me to help him on his feet and down the road so 911 won't haul him into the detox. So I'm out there, you okay? Come on, you okay? Uh. Why, why would he ever say to me, your God is really great for not calling 911, helping me on my feet? Why would, he, why would he ever do that? So that forces me now to take this, this hole. Okay, and here's, I'll just give you I'm going to shorten this down to give you my bottom line um, conviction. I think that the salt and the light that makes the good deeds taste so different, people's hearts go towards God, is when you do them in the context of suffering and you're very happy all along the way. Rejoice in that day and be glad. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. And in that context, don't be so embittered that when you see somebody in need, you say, I've got enough problems of my own. I don't have any time for you. You still, out of the overflow of your gladness, you're moving into another person's life. And while you're being lied about and you're being persecuted with gladness, you are caring for that other person. That will cause them to say, you know, you're strange. Because if I were you, I'd be furious right now at what they said. And I wouldn't be spending any time with, with me. What's, what gives with you. That's 1 Peter 3.15, remember? Be ready to give an answer for the, for the hope that is in you, for the, for the hope that is in you. Where, where does this behavior come from? Where does this gladness in the midst of suffering that spills over to do good for another, where does that hope come from? It comes from Him, and it is so unusual, so salty, so bright, that people say, that's really strange, really rare, rare. That's my take. That's my take on this text. So the, the salt of the earth and the light of the world is good deeds, but it's good deeds done in the context of, of an embattled uh, situation where you are, are maintaining your contentment and you're loving people with, with gladness. You're not bitter and resentful and anger. And, and I, just, I mean, it makes me feel so inadequate. Because I do get ticked off in my neighborhood. I just get so ticked off at being taken advantage of over and over again. And, and that's not, that's not Jesus. Okay. The extent of our sacrifice 
coupled with the depth of our joy. See that connection now? Easy to be happy when the sun is shining. Hard to be happy if, you're, if your house just got struck by lightning or somebody threw a rock through the window. E- extent of our sacrifice coupled with the depth of our joy displays the worth we put on the reward of God. So how are you doing? Great is your reward in heaven, so rejoice in the midst of being slandered. Therefore, God ordains that the mission of his church move forward not only by the fuel of worship and not only by the power of prayer, those are the two we've done so far, but also by the price of suffering, which is where we are right now. This is why he does it through suffering. Remember what prayer is in relation to suffering. We don't call prayer a wartime walkie-talkie because we're in war games. The war is more real than any humans have ever fought because the stakes are so high, much higher, and, and battles are so relentless, and the hatred and opposition is so great. So there's the link between the, the suffering that we may have to endure and the prayer that we're sending up for help. So the Great Commission won't be finished without suffering, and, and I've got... Ten reasons, and I don't know that we'll look at all of these, but let's, let's look at some of them anyway. Because Jesus suffered and said, we would. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If he persecuted me, they will persecute you. They kept, if they kept my word, they'll keep your word. This is a promise. We will suffer. That's why Jesus said to, when you're converting, when you're leading people in, teach them to count the cost. Teach them to count the cost. Like, I will follow you wherever you go. He said, foxes have holes, birds there have nests, son of man has no place to lay his head. You still want to follow? That's, that's the way you talk. You don't, you don't say health, wealth, and prosperity on the way. It's not what he said. Because Paul said there is no other way home. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, he returned to Lystra, to Iconium, to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. So now picture this. I think he's been away just a matter of weeks here. So he's planting churches. And he's moving from town to town. He's leaving behind some leaders and he's pointing elders. And as he comes back through some weeks or maybe months later, what's his discipleship 101? Answer, through many tribulations you must enter the kingdom. Tell the baby Christians, through many tribulations you must enter the kingdom. If, If you give illusions to new Christians around the world in your missions that all goes better, then you are misleading them. Things go worse when you become a Christian. Not everything goes worse. Many relationships improve. Some get worse, some get better. But this is a warning that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom. And there are other texts, of course. Third, because Peter said it's the normal path of blessing. First Peter 4, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you're blessed. You're blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. I'd love to talk about that for 10 minutes. Um, Let me say two things. One, if you ask, does this include getting sick on the mission field, like malaria? Because he's talking about being insulted for Jesus' sake. Rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. Does that include malaria? My answer is yes, for this reason. Any hardship that comes your way 
on the road of obedience is suffering for Jesus. I care if it comes from your stomach or your enemy. Any hardship on the road of obedience. In other words, it's making the path of obedience harder. That can come from outside of you or inside of you. And, and, and the test is the same. Quit the road or stay on the road. Same test. The enemy or the cancer or whatever. It's just making you... And, and how you handle that is the same. Can you handle the, the malaria with... God, I don't understand. I'm trying to serve you, but I submit. I, I pray that you heal me and keep me. Don't let me become bitter or angry or depressed by this. Help me to bear this in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the same way you'd pray if you were getting hit on from outside. So that's the first thing to comment. The other thing is this. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. I'm going to in generalize from that and say there is a, an arriving of God's spirit and of God's glory for every peculiar suffering you endure. Here it happens to be insult. If you are insulted, the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Well, what if you were thrown in jail? then the spirit of glory and of God would be a, a grace for the jail. Well, what if they tortured you? There'd be a spirit of glory and of, of God resting upon you for, for enduring torture. What if they took your kids away and they kidnapped your kids? There'd be a spirit of glory and of God resting upon you. That's what I'm getting. I'm generalizing from this right here. And I'll tell you, and the reason I do is just because I get really scared sometimes when I think of the ways I could be persecuted. I mean, I've got a pretty vivid and bad imagination. And if you, you know, if you watch certain movies and you see horrible things, a brave heart, um, I couldn't sleep for weeks after brave heart. But I mean, I, I, I'm just not playing games when I think of that kind of rack. They put Christians on the rack and they didn't turn it off until they were pulled their arms off. What would I do? All they want you to do is say, Jesus is not Lord, just a few words. And this excruciating, intolerable pain, they'd stop. But what would I do? This is my only hope. This right here is my only hope. There will be a grace for that. I don't have it right now. His mercies are new every morning. There will be a dying grace, a tortured grace, a kidnapped grace, a cancer grace. There'll be a grace. Whatever. You're all going to go through it. Most of you won't be on the rack, but you'll be on some rack. And, and I, I would like you to rest in this. Right now, I wonder, Lord, how would I endure? Please help me to so walk with you that when we get there, your grace would be sufficient. It shows up. It's called future grace. He, he gives it when it's needed. That's what missionaries have to count on for. Because Great Commission won't be finished without suffering because Paul said it's the normal consequence of godliness. 2 Timothy 3.12, indeed all who desire to live godly in Christ will be persecuted. And I think one of the reasons that doesn't seem to be true about us in America may be because we've domesticated godliness. Like we think godliness means don't watch dirty videos and don't cheat on your wife. And who's going to persecute you for that? But maybe godliness means be aggressively God advancing in all your relationships. You know, advance God. Put God more on the agenda. Speak of God more. Intrude God into more conversations. Make God the issue more often. And the more often you do, the more this will come true. Because in suffering, God is refining our faith. Second Corinthians 1, 8 and 9. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brothers. And this is Paul on mission. Okay, he's on mission. 
For we do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, that the affliction we experienced in Asia, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was, that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raised the dead. So what's he saying? God gave us up, or let us in, or permitted us to be so persecuted that we felt, I'm dead, I'm gone. There's no, I'm, I will die. I'm going to die here. And why did he bring Paul to the brink of life like that? That was to make him rely not on himself, but on God who raises the dead. God who raises the dead. There was nothing else to rely on. He was dead. I mean, two more seconds and I'll be dead. So either you get angry and depressed and discouraged and hopeless, or you believe God raises the dead. And God wanted Paul to believe he raises the dead. So he brought him right up to the edge. He had to believe or not. Push him right to the edge. So you ever been there? You will. You will be there. That's what we're getting ready for. So God does that sort of thing in order to make our faith stronger. Because in suffering, God is giving us endurance. This is like working out in the gym and making yourself hurt. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. The testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let the steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. Now, what God wants you... You just have a strong, steadfast faith. So he tests your faith. So when I say working out, I mean like, okay, your faith is, is the power that can lift your arm up and down. It can obedience. And God goes, boo. And you can either just go, bleh, and be an unbeliever, or you can say, no, no. I will obey. I will follow through. I will trust you. And what does that do here? Produces steadfastness. Makes this thing, I just got a little cramped doing that. <laughs> you see, it, it, it's, almost, it's paradoxical. God makes faith hard to have by some kind of trial. Threatens your faith. It's hard to have faith in this situation. That's what hardship is. And yet your faith in resisting the hardship, not giving up, not just laying down and playing dead, in resisting, it's, it's building. It's growing. So that next time, it'll be stronger. God has his ways, doesn't he? Seven, because in our suffering, others are made strong to endure. Look at this. This is remarkable. This, I, you know, don't waste your cancer. Don't waste your suffering. Don't waste anything, because this is one of the effects. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me namely being thrown in jail here in Rome, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Really? Paul's locked up. So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. So right here in the prison, the word is spreading and the gospel is reaching, you know, jailers that it never would have reached and most of the brothers out there having become more confident in the Lord by my imprisonment are much more bold to speak the word. Who would have thought? I mean, who would have, what a strategy. Get yourself arrested. What a strategy for ministering to the praetorium and emboldening the brothers. Now, I don't know which of you will have to pay like that, but God, God will decide who, which of you gets sick and which of you uh, loses your mom or your dad or your child. And in every one of those sufferings, whether it's from outside or inside, whether it's disease or, or persecution, how you respond, others are watching. And it's going to have a, an effect on them. There was another article in that World magazine. I read you one page last night from Mindy Bell's. The article from Andre Sue, she had just met this year, 17 years later. Only a few of you can remember this. In 1994, on I-94 in Wisconsin, a van of the Willis family was driving, and the truck in front of them 
lost something, a big metal anvil type thing off the back. Their van charges over to 60 miles an hour and the van explodes in fire. Mom and dad are in the front seat. Six kids are in the van. They're all dead, except for mom and dad. The children burn alive, what? In front of their parents. And the parents burn on the face, burn on the hands from trying to get at their kids. They were taken away in separate ambulances, and Mr. Willis called out Psalm 34. I remember preaching on it the next Sunday in this pulpit right here because of what they had said in public. And now 17 years later, Andre Sue just met them. And she wrote this article. And she said, if, if I ever complain again, if I ever fail to praise God again, woe is me. Because the effect, this mom and dad, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Never left them. And you just want to get, you know, you just want to go down and, and reverence God for such a work. Six children dead in front of your eyes, and you don't cease to praise God. Seventeen years later, it's bearing fruit in my life. <laughs> Those kids did not die in vain. I'm, I'm convicted. I'm just... Mm. So was Andre Sue. Number eight, because suffering sometimes gets us moving in missions, Saul approved uh, of uh, Stephen's execution, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except for the apostles, and they went everywhere preaching the gospel. So they, they hadn't spread out yet. You remember, you should be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, and they weren't doing it. So what's he do? Persecution. And they're gone. <laughs> what a great way to mobilize missions. If he has to, he will. He'll do it in America if he has to. Number nine, because the value of Christ is magnified in our suffering with joy, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content. Look at this. Can you say this? And this is just radical and wild. I have a deep inner contentment with weaknesses, Insults, this is the one that grabs me, insults. Hardships, persecutions, calamities, like tsunamis, take your whole family away. For when I'm weak, then am I strong. That is Christ's strength. And this is, you know, this, this is another answer to your question, brother. Of why would Satan want to hide the centrality of Christ, the supreme value of Christ from us? Because if, if Paul didn't believe that Christ was the supreme value and all satisfying and that my grace is sufficient for you, he wouldn't be content in insults. He'd be furious at insults. He'd be striking back, returning evil for evil, and nobody would get saved and nobody would be moved by the power of Jesus. But... But Jesus was so satisfying and his grace was so sufficient for Paul that he could say, okay, I'm content to be insulted and to be weak and have hardships and persecutions and calamities. Last one. Because suffering is God's strategy for presenting the sufferings of Christ to the nations. I don't think sufferings are just the consequence of missions. I think they're the means of missions as well. Now, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am fulfilling what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. What does he mean that I am filling up? what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. He means not that Christ's afflictions are defective in their atoning work. It means that what they lack is a personal presence.
presentation to those for whom he died. And he, in his sufferings, is that personal presentation. One of the means that God uses to confront the world with the preciousness of Christ is to embody Christ in the suffering missionary. Americans are wealthy people. We have a hard time going around the world and being seen as anything but rich. So God often sees to it that we suffer so that people can see, okay, Americans are vulnerable too. Now, how will they take that? At home, they've got every possible 911 hospital, antibiotics, you name it, they don't ever suffer. But here they are taking a risk out here with us, 50 miles from the nearest doctor, and how are they going to manage that in their heart? And then, then Christ can be, this is, I'm here for you. Like Christ died for me, and I'm here willing to die for you. And that's what people see. And uh, our time is up. And the question of martyrs is simply a, a specific application of the, uh, the suffering. Let me just go to the conclusion here if I can, if I can get it. Um, here we go. Conclusion, we'll take one or two more minutes and then we'll be on our way. God's ultimate goal in creation and redemption, therefore, is to uphold and display His glory for the enjoyment of His redeemed people from every tribe and language and people and nation. That is, God's ultimate goal is joyful worship among the nations. Therefore, the thesis of this seminar, once more, missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Missions exist because worship doesn't. Worship is ultimate not missions, because God is ultimate, not man. And since worship is the goal of missions, God ordains that the mission of the church be moved forward by the fuel of worship and the power of prayer and the price of suffering, because these make His supremacy shine most brightly. In other words, the goal is His supremacy, and he chooses means like worship and prayer and suffering, which in their very nature call attention to his sufficiency, not, not to mine. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, and this is sweet, kind of where we started at nine o'clock this morning. I'll be with you. I'll be your friend. I'll be your helper. You know, we I'll close with this. The Word of God is so precious to, to missionaries and to all of us. Uh, Isaiah 41.10 would be the closest thing we have to a family verse. My dad gave it to me in 1971 as I got on the plane to go to Germany. And I've given it to all my boys as they've headed off to camp when they're six or have headed off to missions when they're 15 on a mission trip or as they headed off to college. We just gather around as a family, put our arms around everybody and say, fear not for I am with you. Be not dismayed for I am your God. And we go, I will help you. I will strengthen you. I'll hold you up with my victorious right hand. That's, that's Jesus' promise here. I will be with you to the end of the age. And he has very, very special intimacy and special help for those who give themselves to his, his mission. Thank you so much for attention. Let's pray. Father, you know where each of these people is. And I pray now that you would take the things we've thought about together and take them down deep into their hearts deep into their minds. And I pray that the ripple effect of this time together would be that for decades to come and for tens of thousands of miles, Christ 
we be magnified because of the way we live and the mission we do. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You're dismissed.